a very good example of that would be warfare too, wouldn't it? All the way back, right up to collateral damage and friendly fire. There, there's the mark of of war in our language. The people who've been the vectors of new words have historically been particularly traders, soldiers, people like missionaries, diplomats. But trade and warfare have really been two of the main, and they've often sort of proceeded almost hand in hand. What's interesting now is if you think about the the combat zones that, for instance, British and American soldiers are fighting in now, one's not aware of any new words being assimilated. But that's because the nature of warfare has changed. It's much more remote. I mean, actually, when you hear about some of what's happening in Afghanistan and Iraq, it is quite hands-on. But in general, warfare in the second half of the 20th century became much more detached. And the kind of level of contact that you had with the opposing combatants was minimised. So now it's your own techno-speak rather than the language of your opponent that you're uh, you're putting into the, the wider language. That's right. And one of the phenomena that I'm sort of quite interested in when we talk about the present day is what I call internal borrowing, which is where the jargon of a particular area of, of society gets assimilated into the, the mainstream. So you, you get a word which is, uh, I mean, one of the classic examples is the word epicenter, which used to be a very technical word in the field of seismology. But now we seem to be incapable of saying the word center. Everything happens at the epicenter, the epicenter of the disaster, the epicenter of the phenomenon, the epicenter of the political system. It's an example of a word which has been used to kind of try and dignify or sort of scientize, if that's a word, <laughs> things that um, we want to make sound kind of grand. And the language of warfare, there are lots of things that have come in from that. Even quite recently, you mentioned something like collateral damage. We've got things like friendly fire. And we start to use those metaphorically in other contexts. And suddenly they're part of everyday speech. Also, the language of of things like advertising and business, particularly the sort of language of management consultancy, first of all is used to kind of dignify other activities and then eventually becomes kind of metaphorized. Again, I'm not, that's a word I would never say. I, I don't know how even to pronounce it. It's kind of curious to think in these terms, but there's a lot of language which is used to talk about the processes of business, which has become really kind of sort of pervasive, although it really started off as, as sort of management consultants type buzzword. And this is the kind of borrowing which is which is probably most as sort of dynamic now. There's There's comparatively little borrowing from other languages. It's still going on. Um, it's mainly happening within our shores. One interesting thing you raise at the end of the book is there no longer being such a thing as English, but English is, and it developing along what I suppose might ultimately become mutually in, mutually incomprehensible lines. Yes. I mean, it's certainly true that, the, that you've got a whole family of Englishes. It's convenient to talk about English as a monolithic thing because you can't keep saying Englishes. It makes a very kind of uncomfortable writing. But in reality... There are some small differences between the English used in, in Britain and the English used in America and the English used in Australia and South Africa. There are rather bigger differences between the English used perhaps in a city like Bangalore and, say, Birmingham. And then you've got sort of hybrid Englishes like Singapore English, which to a native English speaker in Britain would really not be under, you know, comprehensible. Although someone who has a command of, of Singlish is going to be able to understand English. But what you've also got developing is what some people have dubbed globish, uh, which is a rather ugly word, but we might call it sort of world English, which is a kind of stripped down English for use in, in business and I suppose in some other areas as well, possibly education and things like aviation, which is an English with a, a fairly reduced vocabulary and a fairly simplified grammar. I think it's important to recognise that while over the last 1500 years, the British have been the, the owners of English in some slightly hokey sense, and the Americans, perhaps you could say, the last sort of three or four hundred years. Really, no one has ever owned English, and that's now luminously apparent. And the centre of gravity has moved, and the centre of gravity, I think, really, if we think about the future, is in China and India. And the, I mean, obviously, the, the new economies of those countries have taken a little bit of a knock recently but not as much of a knock as the established economies of, of Britain and America. I do sense that the future of English is going to be shaped in large measure beyond the countries where English as it stands has been shaped to date.